Okay, terrific. Thank you. Well, so thanks, Kim, and thanks, thank you to Cam COVID for the opportunity to present uh, this work uh, or, or this uh, uh, presentation to you today. I'm, I'm going to talk to you. I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the uh, previous presentations. This may be a little bit different because it already describes a whole uh, 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 series of, of uh, bodies of work, centered domains of work related to what our institute has been doing to support research analytics and analytics related to COVID-19 in Ontario. Um, so just, oh, I can't seem to advance my slides. Okay, there we go. Um, so just uh, a couple of slides just to tell you a little bit about ICS. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with the, the organization. So we are an independent not-for-profit research institute. Um, that exists on uh, seven sites across Ontario, uh, originally established in, uh, in Toronto back in 1992, uh, but now we have uh, seven physical sites across the province and also a virtual data access platform that I'll talk about a little bit um, later. Um, the core uh, asset of, uh, of the Institute, besides all the fantastic people, uh, researchers and staff who work there is of course the data repository and so by virtue of a particular um, status under Ontario's privacy legislation uh, ICS is able to routinely receive uh, most of the um, routinely gathered health data that relates to the public uh, publicly provided health services in Ontario things like uh, physician claims emergency department room visits hospitalizations uh, prescriptions, lab results, and so on, as well as a whole range of other data, survey data, um, uh, ecologic uh, data, and, and research that has been brought in specifically by researchers for their own studies and linked to the, the broader data assets uh, to carry out research. And so all of this represents quite an enormous data repository, about 18 billion records on 20 million Ontarians. Of course, that includes uh, uh, now deceased Ontarians, really anyone who's ever held an OHIP card uh, since about 1992. Uh, we have data in our repository, and this creates quite a, a, a large um, um, uh, repository that we leverage for both research and analytics. So in terms of COVID-19, um, when the pandemic began and when we started to realize the extent of, uh, of the outbreak uh, in Ontario and more broadly in, in, across Canada, uh, this goes back to February and, and certainly into early March, we realized that um, there was an opportunity for the organization and its uh, staff and scientists to support COVID-19 research and analytics. And you know, this was really, in the first instance, designed to help support the hospital system, the health system, and the public health uh, authorities in Ontario to respond to uh, to COVID-19. And there were basically four domains of work that we've been undertaking. One is uh, improving the data that we have in order to make uh, our data better able to answer key questions uh, that, uh, that uh, the health system and public authorities uh, and researchers have about COVID-19. Secondly, to enable, uh, uh, to better enable analytics to support rapid modeling and evaluation related to COVID-19. Third, to support researchers both at ICS and external to ICS uh, to carry out COVID-19 related research using ICS data assets. And fourth, to, um, to effectively uh, engage in national research collaborations. And I'll talk a little bit about that. This is really through Health Data Research Network Canada and the SPORC name data platform. So let's talk first, uh, well, let's take each of these in turn and we'll start with better data. So um, again, going back into early March, uh, we recognized that the, the speed at which we routinely receive data really wasn't gonna cut it when it came to providing analytics to support the health system response. So if you take, for example, the Ontario Lab Information System, this is a, a, data, uh, a data set that we receive routinely at ICS. It contains all of the uh, lab test results that are carried out um, on, on the population uh, on an ongoing basis. However, we receive them at best quarterly. Uh, so it's always at least three months behind or so. And if uh, one wants to support the health system uh, uh, a response to COVID-19, we knew that we would need much more timely data than that. And in particular, what we were interested in was the 
uh, COVID-19 test results that were being carried out starting uh, in, uh, in, in, in March in Ontario. Um, so we began to work very early in March with our data partners to, uh, to receive much more rapid, much more timely feeds of uh, OLUS data, specifically the COVID-19 test results data. And now, uh, since uh, well, well over a month now, we've been receiving daily feeds of COVID-19 test result data for the population of Ontario. And these are um, uh, not exactly a real time in the sense that a, a test, that, or if we get a, a feed today, it may not be perfectly up to date for yesterday, but it's usually up to date within about uh, two days of, of our receipt. And, and we're getting these results on a daily basis, um, which we incorporate into our, into our uh, repository. Uh, that data set in particular required quite a lot of cleaning. Uh, the results were received in free text format, and so we created a, uh, an algorithm, a, a Python tool, in fact, to uh, uh, clean that data, which we've licensed and made publicly available for any other organizations that are receiving similar data. The second thing was to uh, attempt to receive more detailed data elements in some of the existing uh, data sets that were received. So a good example of that is address information. So we have some address information on all of the individuals we have in our repository, but we were interested in identifying individuals who were, for example, residing in long-term care homes or residing in retirement homes or other congregate living settings because of their particular risk with respect to COVID-19. So we worked with the Ministry of Health to receive more detailed address information, which has enabled us to analyze uh, those particular populations. We've also undertaken and have concluded a number of agreements to collect brand new data sets that are relevant for COVID-19, which we uh, are just beginning to receive. And, and I won't go into those details just in the interest of time. There is no question that there are ongoing data challenges. Um, and so for many of these data sets, I mean, I mentioned the COVID-19 data, which is now coming in daily, but for many of these other data sets, we still are not receiving them in as timely a fashion as we would like. And there are still major lags in terms of getting outcomes data, things like hospitalizations related to COVID-19, uh, hospital outcomes, and of course, overall population and mortality. This is a challenge really across Canada. The second major domain of, of work uh, was enabling analytics to support rapid modeling and evaluation. So I talk about analytics as being distinct from research because we, uh, ICS is able to use data, health data that we have uh, available to us for health system evaluation purposes separate from research. In other words, it doesn't require an REB approval and so on. It's a, it's a particular process under Ontario legislation that I won't, again, won't go into too many details. But just to say that this, uh, these analytic projects can be struck very rapidly and, and carried out very quickly. Um, and so we use that capacity to begin to produce daily reports for the province, for the health system, for the public health authorities, uh, and, uh, and other um, uh, entities that are involved in the COVID-19 response across Ontario, that profile who in Ontario is being tested for COVID-19, who is positive versus who is negative. And when I say who, I don't just mean where they live or age and sex. We also have linked the, um, uh, the testing data to profiles around com comorbidities, for example. So we know uh, the rates at which hypertensive patients or diabetic patients uh, are being tested. And we're also uh, 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 analyzing uh, high-risk populations, such as individuals living in long-term care centers, retirement homes, uh, and other high-risk populations, such as uh, uh, individuals experiencing, uh, who experience homelessness. Uh, we're also working with um, Indigenous partners in Ontario, both First Nations communities and Indigenous leadership organizations, First Nation and Métis, to produce uh, reports that are specific to those populations. Uh, and we share them directly with those, either those communities or the, uh, the, the Indigenous leadership organizations. And finally, we've also worked with health system stakeholders and uh, researchers, in some cases external to ICS, to use this ability to um, uh, undertake analytics to support modeling, uh, modeling related to uh, capacity and demand, um, capacity as in ICU capacity and so on, as well as expected uh, numbers of cases of, of COVID-19 and other influenza-like illnesses. Um, so this is an example of the uh, uh, 
these kinds of analytic projects that we've undertaken. This is actually the public facing version of the report that we produce on a daily basis uh, for uh, the health system on COVID-19 testing. We also produce a public version, which is on our website and, was, and which is updated regularly. And you can see here, we're providing information on uh, uh, who's getting tested in Ontario and how they can compare with the population of individuals who have not been tested uh, and, and uh, profile them on a variety of uh, factors that relate to, uh, to, to risk. And secondly here, just a, uh, a figure that shows um, the situation over time in Ontario long-term care centers across the province. So there are somewhere around 620, 630 or so long-term care centers. And you can simply see that over time, uh, the number of centers that had no test, no residents confirmed positive has gradually declined, although it's still uh, well over about 420 or so centers that have no residents confirmed positive um, and, and, you know, increasing numbers that have uh, residents confirmed positive, 25%, 50%, even a small number that have more than 75% of long-term care center residents confirmed positive for COVID. So these are part of the reports that we produce and update regularly for both the public and the health system. So the third main area of work has been supporting research, um, COVID-19 research at ICS and by uh, external researchers. So as you can imagine, as has been the case for you across the province, uh, the research community uh, and the ICS research community, uh, no less, has really uh, become galvanized around um, uh, uh, identifying opportunities to study uh, COVID-19. And there have been a, a large number of grants uh, that have been put into CIHR and, and other uh, competitions across uh, the country. Uh, and in addition, about 30 research projects are already uh, approved and underway at various stages that relate to, uh, to COVID-19. These projects really run uh, the gamut of, uh, of uh, um, uh, topic areas from population health to uh, particular risk groups based on uh, diseases that individuals may have, cardiovascular disease, for example, or particular vulnerable populations that are at higher risk. Uh, there are a number of studies on, on pharmacoepidemiology relating to particular medications that individuals may be taking uh, chronically that may confer uh, protective uh, uh, element or added risk uh, if you develop COVID-19, as well as studies on um, risk uh, prediction uh, in COVID infection. And then a number of studies also looking at the impact of the restrictions on health system access and use on non-COVID uh, patient populations. So a whole range of studies, uh, and some of them are actually also taking place in our uh, HIDAP high performance computing environment um, uh, because of the need for machine, machine learning um, methodologies. So uh, ex researchers who are, who are outside of ICS, who are not affiliated with the Institute, can of course also uh, access these data uh, and, and uh, undertake uh, research. And this is through our data and analytics services um, uh, platform. Uh, we call it the DAS, D-A-S platform. Uh, this has uh, been around now for about six years. It's funded in part by the SPOR, the Strategic Creation Oriented Research of the CIHR, and it enables any researcher in Canada uh, to uh, apply for access uh, with the Research Ethics Board approved project um, for uh, access to an ICS uh, linked the identified data set uh, to undertake a project. And so the COVID-19 test result data, for example, is available on this uh, platform and researchers outside of ICS can take advantage of that to undertake studies in, uh, in the province. Uh, and finally, uh, I'll mention our efforts to support national collaborations around COVID-19 research. So you may have heard about the SPORE Canadian Data Platform. Uh, it's been around now for uh, a little over a year. Uh, this is again a CIHR funded SPORE initiative. Uh, ICS is a key partner in, uh, in the SPORE Canadian Data Platform, which links uh, provincial and national data centers from across Canada together uh, to, en to enable uh, multi-jurisdictional research, research that would involve more than one province, uh, typically through distributed analytics, but not, not solely uh, through distributed analytics. Um, the website I've, I've shown here, uh, the cdp.hdrn.ca, so Health Data Research Network Canada is a parent organization that has created the Spore Canadian Data Platform. And I'll just point out that on the website, there is also this page, uh, the website is here, 
which, is, which tells you a little bit about the COVID-19 data that's currently available in various HDRN or Canadian Data Platform partners across, uh, across Canada. So three provinces, Newfoundland, Alberta, and Ontario, uh, have COVID-19 test result data that's been integrated into the, their data platforms. So there is the opportunity already to start to undertake research in multiple jurisdictions. So um, I'll stop there and uh, take any questions that you may have, and I'll just stop sharing my screen here. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we've already got, got questions right, right off the bat, so thank you for that. Uh, Shiraz Khan asks, does ICES contain and provide access to imaging data like x-rays, CT scans, and also genomics data? Uh, no, at present, we don't have uh, imaging data available uh, on our platform. Uh, genomics data, we, th so there are, um, there, are, there are a couple of studies that have imported genomics data into the, our platform uh, for linkage, and so it's possible to do so, but we ourselves do not receive genomics data as part of our repository. So our, a researcher would have to bring that data onto the platform and link it uh, uh, for that purpose. Okay, great. Um, Ma Yen Yu asks, how is ICES health data collection different from the Ontario Min Ministry of Health COVID health data platform that they're proposing, formerly known as Panther? Right, so um, the Ministry of Health has, uh, is building a high performance computing environment to support COVID-19 research. And we're a partner in that, in that effort and we're helping to support it with the provision of, of data. Uh, there are other data uh, providers that are also provisioning it uh, with data. Um, in the, its initial phases, I think that the data will be quite similar uh, be, uh, with respect to what's available through the ICS platform and what's available through the COVID-19 health data platform. Uh, I think over time, there's, a, there's an ambition uh, that there will be additional data, for example, perhaps imaging data, perhaps some uh, other data sets that, uh, that are yet to be determined. Um, and I think at this point, it's fair to say that probably the biggest difference would be the, the, the computing capacity in terms of the high performance computing environment that is that they are planning to build um, uh, in that health data platform. Great information. Uh, Peter Rogan asks, is REB approval required in advance of a DAS application? Can they be su submitted simultaneously? Yeah, so, so, we, uh, so a researcher can reach out and, and begin essentially a discussion or conversation with our staff to say, here's the idea that I'm interested in. Uh, and there's a, you know, the first thing is the back and forth about feasibility. I mean, a researcher doesn't want to sort of go to the trouble of putting in an REB application or maybe applying for a grant and then coming to us and we, and we say, well, actually, sorry, we don't really have the data. That's not really a feasible project. So there is a, there is a, a back and forth to ensure feasibility. We can support grant applications and REB applications in order that um, uh, you, know, you can explain what's available and how you're gonna use the, the DAS platform, but you can't actually start working with the data until you have the REB approval. Got it. Um, Nora Faid asks, are the data in HDRN purely health admin data or are there linkages to clinical outcomes as well? Well, uh, so clinical outcomes like uh, death and uh, hospitalizations and uh, you know, ER visits and so on, those sorts of outcome data would be available with an HDRN. If you mean sort of clinical outcomes like, you know, did someone have a particular, uh, did, a, did a particular diagnosis occur like an AMI? Again, those data would be available assuming that patient, that, that resulted in hospitalization, for example. But if you wanna know, you know, very detailed clinical information like was it an anterior AMI versus an inferior AMI and so on, that's where the devil's always in the details. And the actual data that's available within each of the HDRN sites varies somewhat. So uh, one of the areas of work that we're focusing on is trying to harmonize the data across centers. Um, but, and I will say that in, that in some cases, there can be quite detailed clinical data within particular uh, cohorts uh, that may exist within HDRN sites, but you, there, there, it really requires a conversation between the researcher and, and the staff of the Gain Data Platform to understand what data is available in which jurisdictions that could support a particular research question. Great, that's a very, that's a very complete answer. Uh, Shaima asks, is there any data related to clinical trials for possible vaccines or preventative measures? Uh, well, th so there's no data related to vaccines. Of course, there aren't any vaccines yet. Um, the platform in principle uh, has been set up in order to enable clinical trials that, that, that might want to link 
uh, a, let's say, a, a, a trial data set to uh, administrative data to look at a variety of outcomes uh, or health service utilization among individuals who were in the trial arm versus those in the control arm. So that can certainly be extended to vaccines. Um, there have been no, I'll say there have been no discussions as of yet that I'm aware of around a vaccine trial that would leverage HGRN, but it's certainly possible. Okay, great. Uh, Peter Rogan says that he's a faculty member at one at the at the one of the ICES nodes, uh, Western. I haven't worked with this group on campus. Is the protocol for obtaining COVID nineteen data the same for me as external re researchers? Well, so the, the 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 difference would be if you have if a researcher has an appointment at ICES. Uh, and uh, it, then your concerns are an ICS researcher versus if you don't have an appointment at ICS. The, so there are differences in terms of, uh, of the access, uh, the modes of access, whether you have a, an appointment or you don't. But I will say that overall, um, for example, the costs are the same, whether you're an, an ICS researcher or not. Uh, but there are some nuances in terms of what data is available simply because of our data sharing agreements with our data partners who in some cases want to, uh, that data to be restricted to more internal use. So I, I think for Peter's sake, I'd have to sort of say it kind of depends on what the question is that he wants to look at uh, as to whether access would, would, uh, would vary. Okay, great. Uh, Sing Soon Wu asks, can we get a list of databases including COVID-19 patients data, especially available for external researchers, or do we need to search one by one from the data directory? Uh, well, so uh, if, if the question is what data is available on the data analog services platform, uh, we have a data dictionary. There's a link to it on our webpage that would in indicate uh, the data that is available uh, on the data uh, on the uh, on the DAS data platform, mm -hmm. uh, the COVID nineteen test result data is part of that. Uh, I think truthfully that things are moving so fast right now uh, in terms of new data that's that's being made available and, and changes to data sets and so on. It would always be best for a researcher to contact directly. There's a there's a there's a an email address on the DAS web page. There's also a phone number, 1-800 phone number, someone wants to call and talk to our staff directly to understand what data is available uh, to answer a particular research question. That, make, that makes sense. Um, I, we've come to the end of our questions. Does anybody else, is anybody typing? I can't see if there's a typing thing happening out there, but um, I, I think that you've really covered a lot of information and it sounds like a very, a very useful tool that many researchers could make use of. So that's super great. Um, it doesn't look like another question is coming in. So I think that we'll just go ahead and wrap on up. Thank you again, Michael Scholl. Oh, wait, ah, there was one. <laughs> uh, yeah, one of the barrier is the, high, uh, is the high cost of cutting data in ICES. Is there any solutions? Well, yeah, so there are costs associated with data access. There's no question about it. That simply relates to, the, to our funding model where we're not fully funded to cover all of the infrastructure costs that relate to acquiring, uh, uh, cleaning, um, you know, linking data, making it available to researchers in a secure environment and so on. Um, so, you know, again, we work with researchers all the time on, uh, on, on how to make research more efficient. Uh, as, uh, and so if a researcher is coming to, uh, to us with a particular question, we'll work with them on, on trying to understand what uh, resources they have available to us, to, to them, I should say, uh, in order to make the project as, as, uh, as efficient as possible and as inexpensive as possible. Great. So it sounds like if they have questions, they should contact ICES directly to have them answered. Yeah, I mean, we have a, we have a dedicated team that supports research researchers. So I, I really encourage people to uh, send an email or pick up a phone and talk to our staff. They're they're very happy, and and, and we have a you know the staff are both analytic uh, staff, but also we have a number of staff scientists who who really understand the. Uh, the, 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 uh, the intricacies of the data, how it can be applied in particular research questions, and what might be um, most appropriate methodologies it can and, and can advise uh, external researchers as well. That's great. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Michael. Thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, just as a reminder again, we meet every Tuesday and Friday from 4 to 4.30, our speaker series. You can always find the login information on the CanCOVID Slack. 